Two years ago, I began asking about the state of public health. I was in private practice in Carrollton, Georgia, and I certainly knew that uh, public health um, was a safety net and took care of uh, folks, you know, that was some poor folks in the neighborhood. And, and I knew that they did investigations. We had a meningitis outbreak in Carrollton, and I knew public health came and did their stuff. And, and I'm a gynecologist, so I knew that they did investigations for contacts. I mean, I knew about that. And when Governor Deal asked me to be the director, uh, I really kind of wanted to know what the job entailed. <laughs> uh, there was a debate in the legislature at that time. Uh, should public health be a separate department? And maybe, but you know, it might be too expensive, and I'm not so sure that that won't be disruptive. And so I, I just said, you know, well, well, what does public health do? And it's complicated. <laughs> transportation they build roads if it's a department of corrections they lock up bad people and the public health well we do a lot uh, public health actually was described to me as a red-headed stepchild we've been so many diverse things that we can't figure out how to tell people what we do and um, if things go well nobody notices that's what I was telling Public health means nobody's in trouble. Everything's going fine. If something goes wrong, well, maybe they'll mention public health, but not often. We can't tell public health what we do, and we keep losing money because we can't tell the legislatures what we do. This last year, you know we do newborn screens for the 28 things that can kill our babies. And they did, 145,696 babies were tested. And then there were the 70,000 restaurant inspections of the 26,712 restaurants and 2,350 schools in Georgia. And then there were the vital records, that was 318,000 vital records, births, deaths, that kind of thing that were recorded. And I have yet to get the first thank you note. <laughs> Our job is to protect lives, and we know that we are doing it. And for this kind of thing, that is sufficient. There's some other things, however, that some notice has been taken on. One, the new department stepped up to its position as the owner of vital data in this state. We have the information. We have the birth records, we have the death records, we have the hospital admissions, we have the, the vital statistics. We have the data in this state. And the first thing we did is said, we have the data, we are responsible for it, and we will use it to improve the health of the citizens of the state. And we will do it acutely, and we will do it long term. The acute example is when we had the meningitis scare <coughs> from the compounding pharmacy in the Northeast. This was something that hadn't been seen before. Unusual. People were scared to death. It was in the paper. Um, and let me tell you what happened. One of the people, Ryan Deal, who's our <coughs> communications person, had stepped up to the plate and had established a communication system, an email system, with all the docs in the state from us. Um, and, and my promise was, you'll not get a weekly update from me. I will only call you if I think you need to know something. Four times last year. This was one of them. The symptoms for fungal meningitis were subtle. The people were scared. And nobody knew where all the drugs had gone. So we stepped in. We identified that there was only one facility in Georgia that had received the medication, and that was in Macon. So that means if you were in Valdosta and somebody came in with a subtle headache, you didn't have to do a spinal tap. You could say, no, 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 it's okay. So we did the traditional public health things. We notified all the patients. We notified the doctors on what to expect. We told all the docs where the things were occurring. 
And we were very fortunate in Georgia. We had absolutely no loss of life here in Georgia from the fungal meningitis, although we had exposures. And that's true public health work. And it was expanded because this new department had the ability to communicate with docs, and the docs believed us. We just sent out, CDC just um, reported an increase in antibiotic-resistant uh, interbacterial infections, CREs. There's been a 700 increase in 10 years in some of them, and the death rate's 50% or more. So I sent out, we sent out a notification, and we said, oh, and by the way, simple, traditional public health things like washing your hands on a routine basis and establishing and putting people in quarantine can take care of this. Israel has been dealing with this, and they put in a system in place, and they reduced their incidence by 70%. I guess docs believe me again. I was in the governor's office. I was there for, I mean, I had to show up for something, a photo op for TV. <laughs> so um, there was another group in front of me for their photo op, and this was the ophthalmologist. And this doc turned around to me and he says, I cannot thank you enough for those letters we get from you. He said, I'm the infection disease control officer in my hospital. I got that letter from you. I went back, we changed things in the hospital, thank you. And that's because we're, they're beginning to know who we are. Long term, we did a little thing called, we looked at the incidence of infant mortality in the state. We used the data that we had, and we mapped out the state in mile square grids and said, according to where the mother lived, not according to where you develop, where you deliver, because if you go to a high-risk hospital, that's not real epi information. Where the mother lives and where these things occur, that's real epi information. So we did that. We mapped where it was occurring. We mapped what the causes were. And I got a report to you that the decrease in infant mortality in the last couple of years has been from 8.4 to 6.3 percent. Data makes a difference. And then the second, data makes a difference. That's the first message. Message number two is, what public health can do is bring the coalitions together in a way that probably nobody else can. When we looked at the infant mortality, we did a couple of coalitions. One, when we identified the highest risk of infant mortality, it was prematurity. Babies born too early and too small. Part of that prematurity had to do with elective prematurity. And that is elective delivery before 39 weeks. I gotta tell you, in 2009, the incidence of elective delivery in this state was 65% of the pregnancies. Those of you, men, shut your ears. <laughs> the women in this group who have been pregnant understand what 38 weeks feels like. <laughs> And the pressure you can put on a doctor to get this over. <laughs> that being said, it still is not the right thing to do. Public health had the information. If you have a delivery before 39 weeks, there's a higher NICU, intensive care admission, there's higher respirator use, there's higher antibiotic use, and by the way, we took an epi and put them in the Department of Education, and if you looked at the standardized test in third grade, there's a difference between a 37-weeker and a 39-weeker. It makes a difference. It makes a difference acutely, and it makes it a difference long-term. So we joined the coalition with Public Health, March of Dimes, the pediatricians, the obstetricians, and guess what? In September, our elective delivery was no longer 65%, it's down to 4.5. Data makes a difference. The other thing we were looking at for a coalition is it also has to do with infant mortality, it has to do with SIDS, and has to do with sleep accidents. The reality is in this state that every other day, a baby in this state, a healthy term baby in this state, dies because of a sleep accident. Every other day. 
What that means is, if it wasn't today, it'll be tomorrow. Every other day. So, we're on this thing called the Children's Cabinet. And that's where the commissioners from every single walk of the legislature, I mean, of the government that has to do with children, we meet together. So, public health present, hey, let's do a safe sleep campaign. Oh, okay, that's a great idea. I don't know the results yet, but I can tell you this, that the posters that say a baby should be A, alone, B, on its back, and C, in a crib, the poster that was drawn by Jimmy in public health is now in 5,500 public offices in this state, and now the universities, my understanding, have also asked for it. I don't know if it's made a difference yet. I'll let you know about that next time. But I think, just like the infant mortality, that it'll make a difference. The third thing we need to do, besides have data, bring together coalitions, is to recognize problems and move to do something about it. And the problem we recognized was childhood obesity. I'm sure you've, you guys have heard of that. Childhood obesity in the state, we have the second most obese children in the state. Um, only Mississippi has a worse childhood obesity rate than we do. Um, and by the way, they've made some improvements and they haven't seen the latest numbers. We did what public health does, which was we looked at what other states were doing because we don't want to we don't want to repeat things that haven't worked. I mean, we looked at every uh, Arkansas had the longest um, state efforts as far as childhood obesity was concerned. Uh, they at the point we started looking had been doing in the business of childhood obesity for seven years, so we looked at their results, and unfortunately, their results were they've been doing it for seven years. Huckabee, who was governor when it started, had lost weight, but the children of the state had not. <laughs> so perhaps we need to do something different. <laughs> so using the coalition part of public health, we brought together in a room, first of all, some people that we thought <coughs> he needs to be at the table. We knew psychiatry needed to be at the table. We knew education needed to be at the table. We knew public health needed to be at the table. We knew for what uh, philanthropic organizations need to be at the table. We knew business needed to be at the table. So we started that, and again, your land-grant university stepped in, and they said, we'll help you with that. So we're going back, and I'll see him. <laughs> uh, Dr. Marsha Davis um, said, okay, we'll help you with that. So we brought together a larger group, and we've now had a, with the help of the university here. We have now had a, st a strategy session bringing all the people together to form what Georgia is going to do. And what Georgia has to do, I am convinced, is we cannot just have the state do a certain number of things like, you know, change the rules for <coughs> school lunches. We need every single segment of the society involved in this. This is a huge problem that has to do with lifestyle issues, that has to do with changing not only what we do, but what the children do, what their parents do, what the school does, and ultimately what the society does. And I am absolutely convinced that we can do this. I know we have to. The state legislature passed the SHAPE legislation that said we will do fitness grams for Georgia children. And that was, we'll do a physical fitness exam. It, it's composed of five different things. One of them is aerobic capacity. One is BMI. Um, one is flexibility. One is body strength. And we have the first year of that over. And let me tell you this. Only 16% of Georgia's children tested. And it was 99% of the schools and about a million children in Georgia and only 16% of Georgia's children were able to pass all simple parts of the fitness exam. 16%. Aerobic capacity, which is the closest associated with basic general health, we had some schools where only 1.6% of the children were able to pass aerobic capacity. 20% of the babies didn't pass anything. 
Not only couldn't they walk a mile, they couldn't touch the toes and get push-ups. So, we have a problem. I'll tell you something that I think is the most interesting, and that is we know that kids are in school a large period of time. And we know that it would be great if we had enough money to have thousands more PE teachers and enough money to pay for another hour of school every day so the kids could be exercising that hour. But we know we don't have that. So we looked around, and there is an example here in Georgia, uh, Soap Creek Elementary School in Cobb County. They were able, because they decided that they were going to do it and it was important, they were able to institute 30 minutes of of physical activity in the classroom every single day. And not only did they agree with the national studies that had looked at the association between physical activity and increased test score grades, they were able to replicate that in Soap Creek. And by the way, you know, I'm telling you about all those schools where 1.6 of them, you know, can pass the fitness exam. Soap Creek was the second school as far as physical fitness in the entire state. We think that's the right model. We've met with the Department of Education and they have agreed to help let us look at the at-risk schools and see if we improve their physical activity, do we improve their grades, do we improve their activities in school? And we will see. They have agreed to let us look at the Atlas schools, and they have just agreed to let us look at every single grammar school in the state. And again, the land-grant university has stepped up, and we have some money to do this, but we don't have enough money. But the university here has stepped up and is doing online training to teach teachers how to get children to move 30 minutes a day. The mantra is 30 minutes every day, every child, every school in Georgia. And we're going to be there, and we're going to start it next year. I'm pretty excited about it. So the final analysis, really, you asked me about the state of public health in Georgia. The final analysis is that we are ready to soar. The inaugural State of Public Health Conference, I think, is pretty indicative of that. I understood you had to change your venue several times because people kept just signing up. <laughs> and I think a lot of it has to do because there are a lot of people that now know that we can help determine, and it is important that we work on, where Georgia can go as far as health is concerned. The scholars are engaged, the medical community is engaged, and realizes what public health can do for their practice. The governor and the legislature believe in us. The business community is becoming engaged. And this conference will generate the actionable plan that will outline what we need to do as a state so that we can move forward, so that we can improve the health and protect the lives of every single person in Georgia. We have some examples that say, if you have information and you have dedication and you have determination, you can change outcome. I believe every single person in this room believes that. So for all of you that are here, thank you for what you do. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for your dedication. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your efforts. The new Department of Public Health in Georgia is absolutely delighted that we're part of it. Thank you very much.